Well, why don't we get started? I'm pleased to welcome you here today to hear Dr. Judy Cho uh, tell us about comparative cytokine pathways and in chronic inflammatory disease, clues from GWAS. Uh, Dr. Cho is a gastroenterologist and an associate professor of medicine and genetics and the director of the Inflammatory Disease uh, Center at Yale University. She received her MD degree from Ohio State University uh, in 1986. And then she completed her clinical training, both her residency and her GI fellowship and a research fellowship uh, at the University of Chicago, where she stayed on uh, as a faculty member uh, until her move to uh, Yale. She's uh, quite an accomplished uh, scientist who's done really groundbreaking work in complex genetic disorders, such as Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and is really changing how we view the causes and eventual treatment of some of the most common intractable uh, diseases uh, facing uh, humans today. Her early genetics uh, studies helped demonstrate conclusively that a single amino acid change in NOD2 or CARD15 significantly increases the risk for Crohn's disease. And this finding was one of the first definitive uh, identifications of a risk allele for a genetically complex uh, disorder. Uh, Dr. Cho uh, is a principal investigator for our data coordinating center and is a chair of a steering committee for the NIDDK's IBD Genetics Consortium. Uh, this consortium uh, has performed genome-wide association studies, or GWAS, that has now defined more than 40 genetic risk factors for Crohn's disease. Her lab is currently investigating the functional consequences of some of these IBD risk-conferring polymorphisms, particularly her, her lab is involved in elucidating the role of the uh, interleukin-23 pathway. And I think a better understanding of the consequences will help really target and improve uh, the treatment uh, armamentaria that we have for IBD. She's a member of many, many professional uh, organizations and editorial boards, and I could really go on for a number of additional minutes highlighting many of her additional accomplishments, but I think you're here not to hear that, but to, to hear her tell us a little bit about her work. And so it really gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Cho, who will tell us more about cytokine pathways in uh, chronic inflammatory bowel disease. Judy. Change the slides here. I think I told you that. All right. Good. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rogers, for that kind uh, introduction. So, to overview today's talk, I'll start by discussing an overview of uh, the autoimmune diseases um, and a discussion of the finding that there's a, a significant number of these loci that are shared between distinct autoimmune disorders and in particular pay close attention to the role of cytokines and cytokine receptors uh, in these disorders. Um, I'll next talk about the pathophysiology of inflammatory bowel disease and how the findings from Human Genome-Wide Association, or GWAS, studies have correlated very nicely with existing models of inflammatory, with animal models of disease, um, and in particular with respect to our understanding of the role of the interleukin-23 cytokine and Th17 cells in mediating these disorders. However, post-GWAS, a major challenge moving forward within these associated loci is to define which genes are actually driving the association signal that's identified statistically. And if we can identify those genes, what are the functional effects? And we think that a significant proportion of these functional effects will be mediated through alterations in regulation of gene expression. And I'll show you some very preliminary data that we've obtained on RNA sequencing in Th17 enriched cell populations. Um, and close with some thoughts on autoimmune loci and developing integrated models uh, of disease. So autoimmune diseases and chronic inflammatory diseases, I realize there's a distinction, but for the purpose of this talk, I think I'll just terminology-wise lump them together. Uh, and they can be defined in part uh, through an immune response that inappropriately targets healthy tissues in the absence of a, of a specific infection. And these different autoimmune disorders can be distinguished by the dominant target organ that defines uh, the particular phenotype in question in rheumatoid arthritis, the, the joints, multiple sclerosis, the, the nervous system, and so forth. And my area of interest is studying inflammatory bowel disease, which is comprised of two major phenotypic subtypes, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. 
the reason why we feel justified in lumping these different autoimmune disorders is that there are significant similarities across these disorders uh, on a number of fronts. Epidemiologically, there's some modest evidence for epidemiologic overlap where you have families multiply affected by more than one of these distinct subtypes of diseases. And this general epidemiologic observation has now been complemented by findings through GWAS that many of these autoimmune loci are shared between these dis distinct autoimmune subtypes. There's significant clinical overlap in that they share certain clinical features such as a, an, an age of onset commonly in late childhood or early adulthood. They're characterized by an often waxing and waning chronic course. And most importantly, there's significant therapeutic overlap between these disorders, uh, with the treatment primarily focused on immunosuppressive approaches, um, as, well as, with, as well as biologic approaches, such as the use of monoclonal antibodies uh, that target various uh, components of the immune pathway. And we'll talk particularly about the shared role um, of many of the autoimmune loci between psoriasis and inflammatory bowel disease. And of these chronic inflammatory disorders, perhaps what distinguishes psoriasis and inflammatory bowel disease is that the immune system in both these cases is, is opposed closely to the external environment. And this particular feature of the McKilso immune system may account for the, some of the shared autoimmune loci between these two diseases. But talking about the intestinal immune system, what's unique about it in part is that you have a very high concentration of luminal microbes, which are separated from the underlying immune response by a single epithelial cell layer. Now, through various mechanisms, the intestinal immune response, such as through dendritic cells, are capable of sampling uh, the intraluminal microbial milieu. And this process of microbial recognition, as I alluded to earlier, occurs through multiple mechanisms. Now, when the uh, innate arm of the immune system senses a danger signal, it then is capable of translocating to the mesenteric lymph node where it presents antigen to naive CD4 T cells that have not yet seen antigen. And this process of lymphocyte activation can then proceed eventually through multiple steps subsequently to the presence of um, the, in, the acquired arm of the immune uh, system uh, within the intestinal lamina propria. Now, the intestinal lamina propria consists of an enormously complex cell populations that balance defense functions, the capacity to effectively fight microbes, uh, as well as tolerance functions through a variety of different regulatory mechanisms. Now, this complex interplay between these various cell populations uh, involves an enormously complex series of cell-cell interactions uh, to a large extent which are mediated by cytokines, which will be the focus of our talk. Uh, it's important to recognize that interleukins uh, were not developed simply to be measured by ELISA assays, but actually mediate interactions between leukocytes. And so these three components, microbial recognition, lymphocyte activation, and cytokines, to a large extent can explain many of the autoimmune loci, at least from a candidate gene perspective, uh, that we're seeing through GWAS. So an executive summary of inflammatory bowel disease genetics in 2010 is that consistent with the epidemiologic predictions where you have families with more than one member affected by one member with Crohn's disease and another member with ulcerative colitis, this would suggest that there's going to be a significant amount of the IBD loci that are shared generically uh, between Crohn's disease and, and, and ulcerative colitis. But the fact that the, the Crohn's, Crohn's risk effect is the highest suggests that there will be Crohn's disease-specific loci the most important examples of which are the NOD2 gene, which is an intracellular sensor for bacterial peptidoglycan, and a series of autophagy genes, most prominently ATG16L1, which plays a role, at least in part, in microbial recognition. In addition, there are UC-specific signals, or ulcerative colitis-specific signals, the most important and dominant of which uh, are very specific associations in the MHC class II region, which plays a role in lymphocyte activation. And the most uh, recognizable or interpretable IBD general loci, where you see association shared uh, between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, uh, is along the interleukin-23 pathway, uh, for which there are multiple examples. But it's not just within IBD and between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis that we see this significant sharing between diseases. You can actually go outside of IBD for many of these associations. While IL-23R was first identified with an inflammatory bowel disease, we see very similar patterns of association in psoriasis, as well as ankylosing spondylitis and inflammation of the spine. In addition, in the initial genome-wide association study on celiac disease identified one of its most significant associations outside of the MHC region in a region on chromosome 4Q 
that it's near the interleukin-2, interleukin-21 gene region. But in addition to celiac disease, similar patterns of association are seen in this IL-221 region and ulcerative colitis as well. Similarly, other celiac loci reflecting shared intestinal inflammation uh, uh, propensity, uh, an association on, in, in the near the interleukin-18 receptor accessory protein similarly is shared between celiac disease and inflammatory bowel disease, highlighting the significance of shared genetic loci uh, between distinct chronic inflammatory disorders. And altogether, through published as well as unpublished data, together these GWAS studies have identified over 50 distinct genomic loci uh, with genome-wide significant evidence for association. Here we're defining genome-wide evidence for associations as having p-values in case control cohorts of less than five times 10 to the minus eighth. Now, despite the fact that there are multiple gene associations along the IL-23 pathway suggesting um, that, that this key pathway may be at particularly critical in disease pathogenesis, Thus far, there is no statistical evidence for interaction. Rather, these, re these uh, multitude of loci appear to have additive effects with one another. And between these genetic loci, we also see very large variation in effect sizes, that is allelic odds ratios and significant F estimates. To a large extent, outside of the top three to four association signals we see, most of these effect sizes are relatively modest with odds ratios between 0.8 and 1.2. However, despite that point, it is important to recognize that the effect sizes do not necessarily predict the efficacy of therapeutic targeting. And so this multitude of genetic loci at least has the potential for identifying important new therapeutic targets to treat human diseases. Now, these human GWAS studies have corresponded very nicely with pre-existing animal models of inflammatory bowel disease. So various pathogenic mechanisms that were suggested through these animal models, uh, various gene mutations and epithelial genes, such as the multi-drug resistance gene, um, would suggest that disruption of the epithelial barrier in mice are capable of producing uh, models of intestinal inflammation. In addition, the classic cytokine dysregulation animal models of diseases could include two models that I'll just briefly mention of many. Uh, one of the most interpretable is deficiencies in the anti-inflammatory cytokine IL-10, which results in spontaneous enterocolitis. Uh, another on the flip side of overexpression, the classic cytokine dysregulation that can result in an IBD-like model is the TNF delta ARE mice where a particular portion of the three prime on translated portion of TNF alpha are deleted, which results in increased trans, uh, transcription as well as increased translational efficiency. And so this overexpression of TNF alpha results in the mice in two major phenotypes, ileal inflammation as well as arthritis, the two disorders that correspond to which anti-TNF therapies are effective in the treatment in humans. But perhaps one of the most widely utilized models of intestinal inflammation uh, are models that were developed initially by Fiona Powery, focusing on CD4 T-cell mediated models of infection, uh, where you basically inject a particular subset of the effector subset of T-cells, CD4 positive, CD45 RB high positive injection into lymphopenic hosts, uh, which can result um, in spontaneous infect, uh, infl intestinal inflammation. And more recently, relevant to the IL-23 pathway, in this particular model of disease, as well as in the IL-10 deficient model of disease, an intact IL-23 pathway is absolutely required for optimal intestinal inflammation, suggesting that IL-23 is pro-inflammatory um, in inflammatory bowel disease. Now, focusing on the effects of cytokines in mediating intestinal inflammation, in the process of this interaction between the naive and CD4 T cells, in the presence of the cytokine milieu in which this interaction initially occurs, you can have initial differentiation steps along different pathways, which were mediated in part by key transcription factors, these signature site uh, transcription factors, which mediate the differentiation pathway into these distinct CD4 T cell subsets, um, including um, induced T regulatory cells, which suppress inflammation as well as a variety of different effector cells, such as Th1, Th2, and Th17 cells. And these different CD4 T cell subsets are defined and characterized by classic effector cytokines uh, here outlined. And so a major product of the uh, induced T regulatory cells are interleukin-10 and so forth. The signature cytokines include, uh, as its name implies, interleukin-17 for Th17 cells, 
but another key inter, um, TH17 cell cytokine uh, is interleukin-22. Uh, in addition, uh, work from, uh, so we, it's believed that inflammatory bowel disease results from an imbalance between these effector and regulatory T cell subsets somehow mediated either through an, a, a defect in the crosstalk that exists between these different leukocyte subsets, uh, which can, can certainly contribute to cellular plasticity uh, and imbalance between the effector or pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory T cell subsets. Now, work from Warren Schwarber's lab um, um, established the importance, uh, as well as a number of other groups, the importance of the Th1 cell subset, especially in mediating a Crohn's-like phenotype characterized by high levels of interferon gamma and TNF-alpha uh, within the lamina propria. And for uh, quite a bit of time, this was a predominating uh, uh, paradigm in intestinal inflammation that IBD, in particular in Crohn's, is mediated by high levels of Th1 cytokines. And I think to a large extent that paradigm um, still holds true. However, how to match that central concept uh, of a Th1-dominated phenotype with the finding from GWAS that you have associations along the interleukin-23 pathway. Now, in terms of the differentiation of these Th17 cells, these initial differentiation steps are mediated by TGF-beta, IL-6, and IL-1, perhaps by IL-23. It's not entirely clear at which at multiple steps that occurs along these the, uh, what, where IL-23 plays its role along this Th17 cell pathway. Um, and so the key role then, uh, what was striking in our GWAS study was the multitude of genetic associations that we saw that were relevant to interleukin-23 pathway signaling uh, as well as Th17 cells. So recreating that initial process of the antigen presenting cell T-cell T interaction, the key parts of the initial active or differentiation uh, stages of Th17 cells are in the process of this activation in the presence of the appropriate cytokine milieu involving TGF-beta, uh, IL-1, and IL-6, you have activation of the key transcription factors important in Th17 cell differentiation, uh, including ROR gamma and STAT3. And so I've, um, I've indicated by a red asterisk here those genes that have demonstrated association to Crohn's disease. And one of the initial key differentiation steps in the Th17 cells um, is mediated through the transcription factor STAT3, which is associated with Crohn's disease. Now, one of the key initial differentiation steps uh, in these Th17 cells is the expression, the regulated expression of interleukin 23R associated with Crohn's disease. Another key phenotypic feature of these Th17 cells is the expression of the chemokine receptor CCR6. Um, IL-21 represents a key autocrine growth factor uh, in, these, er, in this early uh, differentiation involved in amplification of this initial differentiation step. Now, interleukin-23 uh, is produced by a variety of cells within the intestinal lamina propria cells, including antigen-presenting cells. The interleukin-23 cytokine is heterodimeric and is comprised of a P19 and a P40 subunit. And importantly, P40 also demonstrates association with Crohn's disease. Now, the binding of interleukin-23 with interleukin-23R activates the JAK stat signaling pathway. And strikingly, we see association within our top 50 signals of both JAK2 and STAT3 uh, uh, in Crohn's disease. And this then enhances the production of the signature cytokines of Th17 cells, including interleukin-17, uh, interleukin-22, and it mediates um, expansion and proliferation of the cell subset. Now, this is not the only factor. There are a variety of different factors that are important in the expansion of these Th17 cells, one example of which um, is, includes prostaglandin E2, which can bind to a variety of different prostaglandin receptors, including EP4, uh, the gene symbol of which is PTGER4, which represents the fourth most significant Crohn's disease association. Um, in addition to the Crohn's disease associations, we see almost identical patterns of association in the sister disease ulcerative colitis. One small note, which may or may not be significant, is that in ulcerative colitis, we also see association to interleukin-21 uh, region. So 
Altogether, this pathway argues strongly for an IL-23 pathway. If IL-23R is the most significant IBD association, and given the plethora of this IL-23-centric view of Th17 cell differentiation, this argues that IL-23 and Th17 cells largely drive inflammatory bowel disease. But what argues against the simplicity of this IL-23 only TH17 uh, paradigm, um, this simplicity can be argued against on a variety of fronts. On the one hand, there's enormous overlap between the TH1 cells uh, mediated by IL-12 and the TH17 cells mediated by inter inter interleukin-23. Now this overlap is mediated at both the cytokine and cytokine receptor level. It's also mediated at the, ge uh, the genomic level. Uh, the genetic variation that we'll talk about in the in part of the talk and regulation of gene expression we'll talk about. And there's also significant phenotypic overlap. We talk about Th17 cells producing interleukin-17, Th1 cells producing interferon gamma. That's obviously too simplistic a model. Within the intestinal lamina propria, there, there's a variety of cells that express both interleukin-17 as well as interferon gamma. Also arguing against the simplicity of the 2317 model is a couple of pathogenicity issues. I'll show you some data on expression analysis, clustering, and disease associations. And importantly, uh, work from both the Mizuguchi lab uh, at Mass General as well as the Flavel lab at Yale University, some of the important signature Th17 cytokines, such as IL-22 predominantly, may actually protect against the development of intestinal inflammation. So going through these overlap issues, the first or second most significant association in Crohn's disease is to the interleukin-23R receptor, which is a unique component of the heterodimeric cytokine, the other component of which is interleukin-12-RB1. The cytokine, like the receptor, is heterodimeric, comprised of P40 and P19 subunits, of which the P40 subunit is shared between interleukin-23 and interleukin-12. And interleukin-12, like interleukin-23, contains unique components comprised of P35 and IL-12-RB2. And importantly, again, uh, TH, uh, IL-12-TH1 and IL-23-TH17 cells. And I've alluded to earlier that we see as disease associations to both IL-23-R as well as P40. And in terms of the genomic overlap between IL-12 and 23, these two genes, IL-23R and IL-12RB2, are adjacent to each other. They are the closest homologs to each other, and they are, the, they are adjacent to each other on chromosome 1P31. So to hone in on this point, in our initial genome-wide association study on chromosome 1P31, IL-23R is comprised of 12 exons, and immediately centrobaric to it is its homolog IL-12RB2, the unique component uh, of IL-12 signaling. Now this plot on the bottom represents the series of markers that were genotyped in the genome-wide association study, and it outlines the linkage disequilibrium patterns that exist uh, for these markers in the area. On the y-axis here, we're plotting the minus log 10 p-value, and you can see that our initial study, we had um, a p-value of less than 10 to the minus 12. And you can see that most of the association signal is contained within IL-23R, and really no association signal is contained within the IL-12RB2 gene region itself. If you examine the haplotype blocks, you can see that all of the independent association signals that we see, which are multiple and independent, we don't think there's going to be a single risk allele within IL-23R, are contained within a single haplotype block here outlined here. There's really one major association signal um, in terms of haplotype blocks, but there's multiple independent functional alleles that we think are driving this association signal. And so this would argue strongly that the association we see is being driven by IL-23R, and most of the evidence would support that. However, it's important to recognize that DNA polymorphisms that regulate RNA expression will not necessarily be confined to haplotype blocks. And an important question moving forward, I don't have the answer today, but an important question moving forward is, does this association signal that we think will affect expression levels of IL-23R, can it also concomitantly express, uh, affect expression levels of IL-12RB2? So much of the work in the intervening years uh, from a variety of different labs have focused on developing in vitro models for Th17 cells because they're a very difficult cell to study because uh, they're a relatively small population. They're hard to differentiate compared to Th1 cells. 
And so on this top panel, we have just a typical picture of naive cells differentiated under Th1 skewing conditions. And you can see that it's very easy to produce a very robust population, 75% here of interferon gamma with no uh, interleukin-4. In contrast, um, it's very difficult to produce high concentrations of IL-17 producing cells. Here you can see using um, TH17 skewing with IL-6, um, TGF beta and IL-1 uh, under activation conditions, only about eight, uh, less than 10% of the cells are able to produce interleukin-17 at this point. And if you look at this TH17 cell differentiation process, uh, there's no co-expression of interferon gamma. Um, it's easier, starting from a memory CD4 T cell population, to get a higher concentration uh, of interferon gamma. And there's a variety of different surface markers for which to try to do this. We've utilized CD161 and CCR6 positivity. So if you sort the memory cells looking for these double positive markers, again, expand them, activate them, expand them in presence of IL-1 and IL-23, you're able to get approximately, here in this example, 33% of cells that are positive for expression of IL-17. Um, in contrast, this double positive versus double negative distinction effectively distinguishes um, IL-17 positive populations from IL-17 negative populations. So if we expand these cells under the same conditions, IL-1, IL-23, you basically have no production of interleukin-17. In addition, it's important to recognize we're plotting here interferon gamma, here IL-17. You have pure populations of gamma and 17. But in this example, we have about 18% of the cells that co-expressed interferon gamma and IL-17. And so it highlights, uh, this particular example highlights the enormous heterogeneity that exists within this general concept of Th17 cells. We then sought to examine on a microarray basis what the differential expression exists uh, between the double positive, mem the memory double positive expanded, both as well as the double, uh, double positive and the double negative expanded um, cells by microarray analysis. And comparing the double positive versus the double negative, we identified 235 transcripts that showed a 1.5 fold upregulation in the double positive TH17 cell enriched population compared to the double negative. And here we're just showing a cluster dendrogram where we have three examples of double positive expanded, three examples of double negative, and comparing them with naive and TH1 cells. So on the x-axis, we're comparing different cell types. On the y-axis, we're clustering these 235 transcripts showing upregulation in the IL-23 treated uh, double positive expanded cells. And you can see clustering on this dendrogram is interleukin-17. Red indicates increased expression, green decreased expression. And you can see that in the three examples here, the double positive expander, the TH17 enriched population is increased in memory, um, and you really see no expression of IL-17 in the double negative naive or TH1 cells. Um, in contrast, um, interleukin-23R and interferon gamma actually cluster more closely together with each other. And you can see that there is, each of the colors represent the expression relative to the other samples um, along the same row. And you can see IL-23R is, has, demonstrates high expression in the double positive expanded uh, population, low expression in the double negative, low expression in naive cells, but actually the highest expression uh, in the Th1 differentiated cell population. And similar patterns in this general cluster for interferon gamma. So if we then drill down uh, on this area clustering around interleukin-17, uh, you have the usual suspects for what you would expect for Th17 cells. You have expression of the signature transcription factor, RR gamma, as well as RR alpha. You have increased expression of interleukin-17, interleukin A and F, as well as CCL20. Um, and these are the transcripts that, present, that are relatively enriched solely in the TH17 cells. But to my knowledge, uh, none of these genes that are TH17 cell specific have demonstrated um, association with human autoimmunity. Um, and this should be contrasted uh, with those transcripts that cluster around IL-23R that are highly expressed in both TH17 as well as TH1 cells. And this particular transcript cluster contains a variety of multiple disease genes, um, including um, interleukin-23R, which I alluded to earlier is associated not just to IBD but to psoriasis as well as ankylosing spondylitis. 
Its close homologue adjacent the genome IL-12RB2 has been associated with primary biliary cirrhosis uh, in a paper in New England Journal. Uh, interferon gamma is one of the top three signals in ulcerative colitis. Uh, in addition, IL-18 receptor accessory protein clusters closely to IL-23R and is associated, as I alluded to earlier, in both IBD as well as celiac disease. So interleukin-18 signaling occurs through IL-18R1 as well as IL-18 receptor accessory protein together, and you can see that IL-18R1 uh, clusters nearby in this, tran in this transcription uh, cluster. Uh, IL-2RA, the alpha subunit of interleukin-2 receptor, has been associated with multiple sclerosis and type 1 diabetes. In an unpublished data, uh, it's associated with inflammatory bowel disease as well. Um, ITGAC, CD11C, uh, is associated uh, with, uh, in, in lupus and, again, shows its clusters in the same area. Uh, and so all of this argues that a characteristic feature of a lot of these associations is not so much TH17 specific expression, but it's those transcripts that are actually upregulated with interleukin-23 treatment and show increased expression in both the double positive expanded as well as uh, TH1 differentiated cells. And again, the other factor to consider in terms of pathogenicity of against, arguing against the simplicity of the IL-23 TH17 uh, paradigm is that while IL-22 actually may be protective against the development of intestinal inflammation, this should be contrasted with a situation with psoriasis where IL-22 actually contributes to the production of dermal hyperplasia and is actually pathogenic, pathogenic uh, in the treatment of psoriasis, or uh, pathogenic in psoriasis. And so the implications for therapy, uh, comparing IBD and psoriasis, uh, this is the outline I've showed you before in terms of the, the, the structure of IL-23 and IL-12 uh, signaling. While IBD shows association with IL-23R and P40, a psoriasis similarly shows same associations, but psoriasis is also associated with the P19 component uh, of the interleukin-23 cytokine. And so taken together, psoriasis does demonstrate a clear IL-23 signature. Anti-P40 monoclonal antibodies are highly effective in the treatment uh, of, of, of psoriasis, and IL-22 is pathogenic in animal models. And this should be contrasted with what I think this, the biology and the genetics are telling us in inflammatory bowel disease, uh, which is showing both an IL-23 as well as an IL-12 signature. Uh, Warren Strober's group established the efficacy of anti-P40 uh, treatment in the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, to be studied is whether targeting anti-P19 and neutralizing that alone will be more or less effective in the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. And I think there is actually good evidence to suggest that perhaps targeting P19 uniquely may not be as effective as targeting both of the 12 and 23 pathways. And so I would also question the paradigm of monotherapy. We got a little spoiled with the success of anti-TNF alone being highly effective in the treatment of Crohn's disease. And given the plethora of gene associations that we're seeing in genome-wide association studies, perhaps it's too simplistic for us to hope that simply targeting a single inflammatory pathway will be effective uh, in the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. And this idea of single therapy, multiple therapy, I think can be extended to the general idea of monogenic versus complex disorders, uh, considering IL-10 inflammatory bowel disease and therapeutic uh, considerations. Obviously, most cases of inflammatory bowel disease do not reflect mon uh, Mendelian forms of, of disease. Um, and it's interesting to note that in the German genome-wide association study, they established that polymorphisms near the interleukin-10-19 gene region showed one of the top associations to ulcerative colitis. And published last year by Grimbacher et al. in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, autosomal recessive mutations in either component of interleukin-10, either IL-10-R1 or IL-R2, uh, results in an IBD-like picture. However, it's important to note that obviously the functional effects from these highly penetrant Mendelian forms of disease or the animal models of disease are obviously going to be extremely different in terms of the subtleties of alterations of IL-10 effects. The common non-Mendelian non variants will likely be much more subtle in their functional effects. And so what implications does this have for uh, IBD therapies? Well, early studies using um, systemic interleukin-10 was not effective, but this could well have been a delivery effect with insufficient levels of IL-10 uh, present locally to actually induce a beneficial therapeutic effect. 
And so I would argue that a logical approach to therapy moving forward would be to combine um, anti-P40 monoclonal therapy, monoclonal antibodies uh, with interleukin-10 locally. Um, given the plethora of gene associations, um, I think that these kinds of considerations are going to be important moving forward. And so given this, I think it's very difficult for the field of complex disorders to think about, with some rare exceptions, so the major NOD2 associations or the major IL-23R associations, it's going to be difficult for us to study in great detail the functional consequences of these very subtle human polymorphisms. And so given how many associations we're seeing, how do we go from genes to functional effects to predictive models of disease and ultimately benefit for humans? It's a very long road to go. But I think one logical place to go is to really understand at a very granular level the nature of the functional effects. And I would argue the first step to look at would be expression that's driving the association signals that we see. Now, I've alluded to the fact that we see associations in STAT3 and CCR6, that's a little bit disingenuous because if you actually look at the patterns of association that we see on chromosome 17Q21, the obvious candidate is STAT3, but within the association peak, we actually see four distinct transcripts. Similarly, the association on 6Q27, which houses CCR6 right in the middle of it, uh, contains uh, three transcripts. And so there's still quite a bit of work to do to actually nail down what the causative gene is or the causative allele. And terribly importantly, what are the functional effects in terms of expression? Will the expression of the, of the transcripts go up or down? That simple question for most of these alleles uh, have not yet been defined. And so I would argue that what's needed are genome-wide approaches to defining genetic variation uh, that, that then alters RNA expression. And this has been done uh, to a large extent in lymphoblastoid cell lines through expression quantitative trait loci, or EQTL mapping, where you're taking uh, large sample sets and simply comparing genome-wide the DNA variants with variation in RNA expression, primarily in these B-cell-transformed lymphoblastoid cell lines, um, and this has identified a whole wealth of EQTLs across the genome. And the established EQTLs probably represent only a subset of the functional DNA to RNA mappings uh, because, for a variety of reasons that I'll talk about, with respect to the autoimmune loci, a couple of successful DNA to RNA mappings were reported with respect to IL-2RA uh, in type 1 diabetes from John Todd's group, as well as CD58 from David Haffler's group. Another approach genome-wide to try to do these DNA to RNA mappings uh, is through allele-specific expression. I'll talk about this so that in comparing, instead of comparing RNA expression between individuals, you can actually look within an individual for allelic imbalance between the two RNA species expressed within an individual. Um, in addition, another factor that needs to be considered is that disease loci contain, to address this issue of disease loci containing multiple genes, it's important to recognize that, the, um, uh, that there's going to be differential expression and disease-associated SNPs that correlate with altered RNA expression. And so how, if you have multiple genes in association region, how can you actually hone down which is the, which is the causal gene? Um, I would argue that in relevant cell systems, if you see differential gene expression between T regulatory as well as TH17 cells, that would prioritize that gene as being most likely as contributing to disease. Um, but it's important to recognize that many of the association signals that we see contain close homologs that likely res that res develop through gene duplication events related to IL-23R and IL-12RB2. There's an enormous gene cluster uh, in the celiac association containing interleukin-18, as well as multiple components of interleukin-1, uh, as well as IL-2 and 21. So it's quite possible that a single genetic uh, association that we see may actually coordinately regulate the RNA expression of multiple close homologs simultaneously. For those gene associations contained within gene deserts, or if we don't find a compelling example of a DNA to RNA mapping in known protein coding genes, it's quite possible that novel transcript discovery may be important, uh, and these non-coding RNAs may be identifiable through RNA sequencing. But I think what's critical moving forward um, is to determine what RNA source is most appropriate to study. A simple example is abundance. Um, if you're not going to be able to identify significant differences between individuals if the transcript is so low and difficult to quantitate. 
Uh, one concern that we had as approaching this is will the disease gene signals actually be drowned out by the abundant transcripts? With RNA-seq, you could theoretically get a very large dynamic range where the abundant genes like GAP-DH are going to take up all of the sequencing space. And so that's a question that we had as we started approaching RNA sequencing. And not only the abundance issue, but also the relevant regulation. It's possible that the DNA polymorphisms that regulate RNA expression may only do it in particular biologic contexts or cellular activation states. So we've begun our analysis. I just want to present some preliminary data that we have uh, on RNA-seq using this double positive Th17 enriched cell population. We started with two healthy control individuals. CDNA libraries were prepped and sequenced. And we utilized uh, the 75 base pair reads using the genome analyzer, and we actually used paired end reads, which are superior for mapping these reads to unique components uh, or unique parts of the genome. Uh, for our first set of experiments, we did a little bit of overkill, and I think we have to still do this, of utilizing two flow cell lanes per sample. And so in these two healthy control individuals, we mapped 102 and 108 million reads of these 75 base pair reads per individual. And this is consistent with what's in the literature. About 70% of these reads were successfully mapped to the, to the genome. Uh, we, we mapped it using MAC. And for the next slides, what I'll show you are the estimated exon counts, uh, which are simply uh, determined by taking the number of aligned sequences to a particular exonic read and dividing it by the exon lengths. We still have to do some technical adjustments um, uh, to look for these sh very short exons that are less than 75 base pairs. And so there are a, a close to 36,000 unique ensemble transcript clusters. And of those 36,000 unique tr uh, transcript clusters, uh, about 14,000 of them had zero map sequence reads. And so this is one simple advantage of RNA-seq over microarrays. A zero is truly a zero uh, in RNA-seq. Um, and we had close to 12,000 clusters with greater than 10 mapped sequence reads. And so this is a histogram plot plotting the highest exon counts for these 11,800 transcripts having more than 10 sequence reads for the single most abundant exon. And so on the x-axis, I'm plotting the log 10 of the sequence-based estimates for the exon count. So the number of sequence reads mapping to an exon divided by the exon length. And so you can see that in this particular, on the y-axis, we're plotting transcript frequencies. So this particular bar hovering around two, um, that the, the, there's about 100, uh, there's, uh, there's about uh, 400 distinct transcripts or ensemble clusters where we have about 100 exon reads um, uh, for, the, for those particular 400 transcripts. And you can see that in this log 10 uh, distribution that it's a normal distribution and that one of the concerns we had is that all of our signal that we might be interested in be drowned out uh, by these very abundant transcripts, but that's actually turn, turning out not to be the case. And so again, we're only plotting uh, those reads that are more than 10 reads. Um, here's 1,000. And you can see that most in our normal distribution, most of the transcript frequencies for these uh, ensemble clusters are kind of uh, spanning between 31 to 316 reads per exon. So the next question we asked is how abundant are the relevant transcripts um, in Th17 enriched cells? And so in our genes of interest, uh, I breathed a big sigh of relief when I saw this, um, is that if you look at IL-23R, the most abundant exon, we are able to actually sample quite effectively with a 54 exon count. We'll tell you what that means in a second. Now, since this is poly A uh, primed, uh, in most of the cases you're gonna see the most abundant exon being the three prime UTR exon. In the case of IL-23R, intriguingly, we see kind of modestly more exon counts in the middle of the gene, suggesting the possibility that there's alternative splicing uh, that may exist between that. And in comparison, um, IL-12RB2 next to it is much more abundant, and the common component of the IL-23 receptor is the most abundant. So again, these parts of, on, on 1P31 are likely the rate-limiting components um, of the functional IL-12 and 23 receptors. The corresponding cytokines are, are much less abundantly expressed, so P40, zero sequence counts, uh, P3522, and so forth. Uh, the Th17 uh, transcription factors and signature cytokines are robustly assayed uh, in this RNA-seq example. Again, uh, not necessarily most abundant in the three prime UTRs, suggesting um, uh, alternative modes of regulation. Things that should be zero were zero. 
Um, so the, we shouldn't have the TH17 or TH2 cytokine IL-4. Um, so absolutely no um, sequence reads there, uh, IL-1 beta, so forth. Um, so it's quite, uh, quite negative. So you can clearly much, in using this approach, you can actually much more clearly define sources and targets of, of cytokine effects. Uh, other components of IL-23 signaling, uh, JAK2, STAT3, CCR6, and PTGR, I've outlined as follows. And kind of interestingly, again, I don't know if this is significant or not, we see that the, the two signaling partners, JAK2 and STAT3, are quite different in their transcript abundance, uh, suggesting the possibility that JAK2 may actually be limiting. Uh, it's interesting to note that in some of the microarray studies of intestinal tissue, we see induction in IBD in uh, inflamed intestinal tissue of JAK2 uh, in inflamed intestinal tissue. Uh, with respect to IL-221 signaling, absolutely zero production of IL-2 uh, of IL uh, in this TH17 cell expansion and, and modest expression uh, of IL-21. And then uh, clearly suggesting that this is a pathogenic subset that we're profiling, um, zero sequence counts of IL-10 and robust expression of both interferon gamma uh, as well as TNF-alpha. So how does this compare uh, with microarrays? And um, pretty, pretty consistently. And so these represent um, actually biologic replicates. These are different samples. We didn't actually sample the same RNA. So um, if we plot on the y-axis the log two of the microarray intensities normalized by PARTEC, uh, on the x-axis the log two average sequence counts, you can see a Pearson correlation coefficient of 0.76, which is consistent with what's been reported in the literature actually comparing technical replicates. And so it's pretty good. Um, here we're simply logging the 150 most upregulated genes in the double positive cells. But somewhat surprisingly, one of the expectations, if you read a review article on RNA-seq, they all talk about the improved dynamic range of RNA-seq compared to microarrays. We didn't see a huge difference, at least looking at these upregulated genes. Um, the, if you look at the highest expressor to the lowest expressor, it's only 6.4 log 2 units by sequencing, which is only modestly higher than the dynamic range that we see with microarrays. The other potential advantage to RNA-seq compared to microarrays um, is the capacity to test for allelic imbalance. Um, and by this, um, you can imagine that if you have a SNP within an express sequence, here defined by a C or a T, you could potentially identify a different number of sequence reads between these two distinct sequences. So factors that are going to affect the capacity of RNA-seq to map functional polymorphisms to variable RNA expression by far the most significant limitation is going to be the presence of a disease-associated SNP or polymorphisms within the exons or the five or three prime UTRs. Uh, another modest factor to consider is the polymorphism frequency. Like anything in genetics, your capacity to accurately assay very rare variants is going to be limited. But for those variants that have a higher than 10% allele frequency, uh, we estimate that 10 individuals should be plenty to identify, um, to actually identify and assay that particular uh, variant. Um, and on the next slide, uh, I'll outline the power calculation for sequence abundance and effect sizes. How different do we think these two different species of, of RNA will be expressed within the cell? And so here we're plotting on the y-axis power to detect allele-specific differences. Uh, on the x-axis coverage. So again, recall that with using two sequencing lanes, most of our transcripts clustered between 30 and 300 um, sequence counts. Um, and you can see that the critical juncture um, for these different colors is between 62 and 67 percent. So the turquoise color represents a 72 percent allelic imbalance. So one species is 72 percent of the sequence reads, the other one is 28 percent of the sequence reads. And you can see that for the coverage that we're actually obtaining for most of these sequences, we actually have pretty good power to detect allelic imbalance. So sequences coverage is between 40 and 100 will have an excellent power to identify allelic imbalance. Um, so just to show you what these data look like, um, here we're looking at the IL-23R, IL-12 RB2 gene region. Um, here is the, is the Santa Cruz uh, outline of the exons uh, of these two genes. So recall that the association signal contained the three prime portion of IL-23R and extends into the intergenic region but does not include IL-12 RB2. And you can see that the sequence ca counts are on the y-axis and that IL-23, uh, while clearly assayable, is much less abundant uh, than IL-12 RB2. 
Um, but I think that the real advances are going to be through novel biology and improved annotation of the genome and the transcriptome. And it's clear, even just in the early days of RNA-seq, that there's a very incomplete understanding and very poor annotation uh, of the three prime untranslated regions. Um, here's the prostaglandin receptor, PTGER4, which again recalls the fourth most significant association in Crohn's disease. And uh, PTGR4 is a three exon gene. Uh, transcription in this case is sense. And the annotation suggests that there's a variable length, uh, potentially, of the three prime untranslated region. And you can see robust sequence coverage for these first two exons. Uh, we don't have a terrible three prime bias here, but interestingly, you see differences, uh, marked differences. And these are both the two sequences we looked at, sample one and sample two robust sequences, but you see that they're occurring along this very peaked appearance, suggesting the presence of uh, alternative three prime UTR structures, which clearly will potentially have uh, functional effects. So in terms of summaries of RNA sequencing, uh, the landscape of transcriptome abundance in interleukin-23, double positive expanded memory CD4 T cells, uh, the critical disease-associated key pathway transcripts can be assayed robustly with two sequence uh, lanes. Uh, somewhat surprisingly, in my mind, the dynamic range of RNA-seq is only slightly greater than that for expression microarrays for IL-23-mediated uh, differentially expressed genes. Uh, the limiting factor to utilize RNA-seq to define allelic imbalance is the presence of the relevant SNP within expressed sequences. Where we have that, I think we'll actually be able to pick off important directions uh, of alternative expression. And importantly, one of the IL-23-R associations is contained within the 3 prime UTR of that gene. Um, we're only at the beginning of this. There's going to be enormous isoform variability. There's going to be complex 3' UTR structures. And I think most of the excitement is going to be through novel expressed sequences and small RNAs, all of which can be identified through this approach. And so what's occurring, uh, currently occurring in my lab, pending in future studies, are comparative studies uh, comparing different cell types as well as going into patients. So toward an integrated predictive model of disease, uh, the power of GWAS is the capacity to definitively, in very large numbers, map DNA polymorphisms to autoimmunity. There's obviously an enormous amount of work yet to be done. Uh, I've, prevented, I've presented what I think is one way forward, which is to, is to similarly confidently map uh, these DNA polymorphisms to alterations in RNA expression uh, using in vitro systems. And the, this approach will prioritize which cis transcripts may actually be driving the association signal. What's crucial is, to, is a very simple understanding of the directionality. Does, is, does the does DNA polymorphism result in increased or decreased expression of the RNA, as well as the possibility for novel discovery? But where we have to go then is RNA analysis uh, of more complex samples um, using perhaps peripheral blood biomarkers um, because that's going to be much more um, easy to sample in large numbers. We can potentially utilize that to define disease subsets. It's important to also analyze this in the context of therapeutic interventions in humans. And ultimately, what will be most important is sampling the relevant organ tissues, in, in our case, the intestine. And I think very important insights will be obtained by comparing across these different autoimmune disorders. And so one early example of whereby this occur, may occur um, is through the Immunochip Consortium, uh, which has largely been organized by Panis de Lucas at the Sanger Center, where over 250,000 B types, or roughly genotypes, will be tested um, that includes on this uh, genotyping platform uh, all European answers for 1,000 genome SNPs at all the autoimmune loci, and um, importantly, all the major autoimmune disease groups are participating. Uh, the initial analyses will be within diseases, uh, but shortly thereafter, we will proceed with analyses across different autoimmune diseases. So in conclusion, at this point in time in inflammatory bowel disease genetics, GWAS have identified over 50 IBD loci. However, for most of these loci, the functional consequences are un undefined. Um, many will likely alter gene expression in specific functional consequences. I think one of the most interesting questions moving forward is to really get more granular understanding of the distinctions between the IL-23 associations between IBD and psoriasis. For example, why do we see associations for, for P19 solely in psoriasis? And there will be important end organ effects, the example of IL-22 being protective in intestine and pathogenic in skin. Um, I've alluded to my personal bias that in terms of therapeutic implications, that we may have to target multiple pathways simultaneously uh, to most effectively treat inflammatory bowel disease in the short run. 
Um, we're clearly on the cusp of a sequencing revolution. Uh, we're headed towards a data deluge, going from an analog world to a digital world. What's going to be required moving forward is the integration of data types uh, across diseases, multiple different distinct data types. We've talked about RNA-seq today. We're moving forward very aggressively in sequencing DNA, uh, looking at private, rare mutations, private to individuals, uh, as well as being able to assay insertion, small insertion deletions much more effectively uh, than we can through um, SNP chips. Um, a, a burgeoning field, obviously, is the epigenome and chip seq. Uh, sequencing of the intestinal microbiome is obviously proceeding um, quite rapidly. Uh, there are going to be broad uh, applications. Uh, and the analytic requirements and opportunities will be enormous. So just a practical note regarding genome-wide approaches versus custom chips in terms of cost efficiencies. Um, GWAS has, I think, been very successful in prioritizing key autoimmune loci. Um, and we proceeded from a genome-wide approach of testing all common variants of these genome-wide chip, SNP chips with immunochip, which is targeted more intensely on areas that we know. And it's cheaper. This is just a very practical, mundane point. But a GWAS chip will typically cost $400 to complete. The immuno chip is going to be on the order of $60 to complete. And that cost difference, I think, will be very important in thinking about the studies that we need to do moving forward. We're able to do, it will be able to do immuno chip in over 200,000 samples uh, across autoimmunity. Now, um, I've made the argument that RNA-seq is going to be a very important tool moving forward, and I think the major immediate advance will be in novel discovery, but it's not going to, we're not going to be able to high throughput this um, very quickly. And so there's going to be a continued role uh, in the near future for expression arrays, but we also have to look into developing, as we do RNA-seq in key contexts in relatively small numbers, to then immediately go from RNA-seq to custom arrays uh, based on relevant expressed sequences uh, quite, uh, quite rapidly. And so this process of intensely studying small numbers of patients and then developing custom arrays, that customization will make possible a rapid scale up uh, in larger sample sets, as well as numerous clinical and biologic scenarios. But to close with the major, major bottlenecks in terms of sampling human disease much better, the bottlenecks will continue to be sample collection first, um, intellectual and computational second, maybe intellectual should be first. Uh, and I think the solution for this will ultimately be team science. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the people who did this work. Uh, the laboratory work was led by Wei Zhang, a very talented postdoc in the lab. The analysis of RNA-seq was performed by John Ferguson, uh, a postdoc in the laboratory. Uh, the genetics work, it's been my privilege to lead the IBD Genetics Consortium over the past several years. I'd particularly like to acknowledge the efforts of Mark Daly at the Broad Institute along these lines. Um, my transition to Yale has been extraordinarily gratifying uh, on a number of fronts. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the efforts of my immunology collaborator, Claire Abraham, uh, collaborating with Richard Favell on some of the RNA-seq issues uh, and epigenetics in TH17 cells. And we've had a very uh, fertile collaboration with Hong Yu Zhao in the department. And the sequencing endeavors in Yale really have been driven by Rick Lifton making a major investment for sequencing here, uh, as well as a very talented postdoc in um, Miran Choi, uh, who I'd like to particularly acknowledge. Um, and then Peter Gregerson at the Feinstein Institute uh, is leading the Rheumatoid Arthritis Consortium. And a lot of the work internationally has really been driven by Miles Park at Cambridge. So thank you for your attention. First of all, I want to thank you, uh, Judy, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I, was, I was very interested in, uh, in your, the point that inter the interferon gamma gene was associated with ulcerative colitis. There's absolutely no evidence that that plays a role in ulcerative colitis. Yeah, um, that, that's a little, I mean, there is some evidence that um, so the association signal is spans is north and south of interferon gamma. It just spans it. Um, and in our genome-wide association study, it's actually the third most significant signal that we see. Um, so I don't know how to, uh, I, I take your point. Yeah, you are the cytokine expert in, in, in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, but that's what the data are. Now it's formally possible, again, this is why we have to do RNA-seq and, and really drill down 
it's possible that it may, we don't know what the effects are in terms of directionality and alterations of interferon gamma expression. But the, if you, I don't have a slide of this, but the association signal actually straddles interferon gamma. We have independent signals north and south of it. It should also be noted that the adjacent gene to interferon gamma is interleukin 26, and then downstream of that is interleukin 22. But the major statistical association spans inter interferon gamma. Uh, that was a tour de force. I enjoyed it very much. It's lucky that you're dealing with such a tractable disease that's willing to be genetically analyzed. Uh, my question has to do with twice you emphasized the potential of combination anticytokine therapies. And as a nephrologist, I'm interested in this, and IDDK is going to have a meeting focused on anticytokine therapies. Could you talk about the perils or the potential toxicities of dual therapies because they're so critically important in terms of the immune response. Are we going to give patients cancer or infections when we do multiple uh, blockades? Yes. So there's no question. Um, Any time you block one of these cytokines, you're, you're, you're likely to increase the risk of infection and potentially neoplasias. Um, the argument that I would make is that I wasn't arguing for two, anti or two cytokine blockades, but rather anti-P40 and local therapy with either interleukin-10 or interleukin-27, uh, which still will have potential infectious complications, but I think would be potentially safer uh, than systemic therapy. Thank you. Good. I want to thank uh, Dr. Cho again for a beautiful and very informative uh, talk. Uh, and we, we look forward to future discoveries. Please join us for a reception that we'll have just next door in the auditorium where we continue these discussions with Dr. Cho. Thank you for your time and attention. <laughs>